What's going on everyone? Justin again as always. Thanks for watching my channel. Welcome back. Cheers to those of you that have your beers. I hope you're enjoying your work week. Tuesday, getting ready to step into hump day. Midweek, huh? Hopefully you guys aren't having to play too much catch up and hopefully your Wednesday is just as busy as you want it to be. That being said, before we dive into tonight's discussion topic, make sure to be a bud and grab some studs. You can do so by clicking that little beer mug in the bottom right hand corner. We appreciate it. Makes you a subscriber. And being a subscriber is pretty cool, right? So long as you keep your little beer mug filled. That being said, make sure to hit the notification bell too so you can be notified when I post my next mechanical insight video, tool review, how to video, or you simply just want to hang out with us on TGIF. All right, let's get into tonight's discussion topic. So what is the benefit of doing a good multi-point inspection or MPI? And who does it benefit more, you and or the customer, or does it benefit both parties? We're gonna talk about that today. We're also gonna talk about some after repair practices that you should keep in mind. Um, just things that I think that would help improve the overall quality of work uh, prior to re-delivering it back to the customer. Let's go ahead and kick it off with this uh, M MPI multi-point inspection. So who does it really benefit? Well, truthfully, it benefits both parties. It benefits the customer because they get to actually see the overall health assessment of their vehicle, right? They get a vehicle health report of anything and everything wrong that is with their vehicle at whatever mileage interval that they bring it to you. Whether they're coming in at their first service at their 5,000 miles or 10,000 miles, like. Our Volkswagen Tiguan, its first service was a 10K. And then later on, we had a little check engine light that popped up, we had to take it back, right? We got like two or three first services after that. And it was pretty cool, right? And they gave us a multi-point inspection. And it let us know of any other changes that may have happened as a result in between. Because maybe there was some recalls or some TSBs. Maybe there was some software updates, things like that. But the overall point of the multi-point inspection is to let the customer know the overall health of their vehicle. So how are their brakes? How are their tires? Is anything leaking? Are the shocks or struts blown out? Are they leaking? Uh, are the tires wearing abnormally, like on the inside or the outside? And does an alignment possibly need to be done? Are the tires tread in the front getting a little bit too low and the backs look pretty close to new? Maybe it's time to rotate. If you take it for a test drive around the block and you feel a little bit of vibration, maybe it's time to do a little rebounds, you know, things like that. Going underneath the hood and doing your underhood checks, you're checking for the, the fluid level, okay? You're checking to see where the brake fluid level's at. The brake fluid is right at or just below half, might be an indicator that the brake pads are getting a little bit low, right? And you can't always see them through the inside and outside, and I know I've made this argument in the past uh, with my previous employer depends on the vehicle. Okay, There are some vehicles that you can see that brake pad touching the rotor or that brake pad very well separated from the rotor. Very, very good. It is 100% obvious. And the outside spoke gaps to the wheels, there's at least a big old triangle space where you can see it. So obviously there are some cases that you don't have to take the tires off. But for those ones that are hubcap or they have the the steel wheel with the little holes in it, you're probably not gonna get a good visual through there. Don't try to figure out how to stuff mirrors this way, that way to try to see, just take the wheel off. You'll probably have the wheel off faster than you'll get a visual with a little mirror. So, and then it's gonna be quicker. So that, that's, that's the idea of the game, right? Because all multi-points are considered a courtesy to the customer. So there's no charge for the multi-point. It's a courtesy, it's a favor to them. So that way they can see where their vehicle is currently at overall. Things that can easily be neglected or not checked because they weren't, uh, com they weren't common as far as what they were trained or showed to do would be like checking the cabin air filter, right? It's on the MPI, but some cars don't have them and some techs don't know the location of them. Most of the time they're just behind the glove box and yeah, you gotta, you gotta move some things inward, outward, and you gotta move the little tiny nylon strap out of the way to get back there. I found one where the door was actually just kind of flopped down and broke and the filter was just disgusting, right? But check if it has a cabin air filter, utilize service information to see if it has one, if you're not sure. If you go behind the glove box and it's not there, maybe it's in front underneath the cowl, okay? Because sometimes they put them there as well. 
Sometimes they're just at the bottom of the leg bolster or the foot bolster, kind of in the center console-ish area, but towards the back and up here by like the firewall-ish carpet area. And you gotta pull that back and then slide a door open and pull it to the side. Sometimes it's on the driver's side and not always the passenger side too, so you got that. Sorry, big old cockroach. Anywho, where was I? Radiator caps, yes. So I have a tester uh, for Asian vehicles. I did not have the domestic uh, radiator cap tester because my previous employer and everyone there had one, so if I ever needed one, we just borrowed one of theirs. But I did end up ordering one from Jeff. I actually also uh, ordered one for Volkswagen as well. A pressure tester for the coolant bottle for Volkswagen, not a Volkswagen cap tester. Yes, there is a coolant pressure tester, Venturi lift or air lift, and it'll cover pretty much every single vehicle, European, domestic, Asian, plus it'll give you your cap testers made by ATD, and I'll put the Amazon affiliate link down below in the description for you guys. This is a phenomenal set. Shane actually has one, and it was great. I think even a buddy of mine over at the Chrysler dealership has the same exact one. And he's had it for a very long time, ever since I've known him. It's been about seven years-ish that I've known him. So almost as long as I've known Jeff. But overall, really great kit. All right, some other things. Tire pressure. I know that some guys try to go off of the TPM sensor and that the TPM sensor light is not on. They feel that that is an indicator that the tire pressure is fine. Sometimes you can thumb through the the instrument cluster or the, the little scroll panel of information, it'll tell you what the tire pressure is. That's not a bad way to go about it, but it's a better way to actually check it with your air chuck. Your digital air chuck or whatever air chuck that you use is gonna be the best way to check tire pressure and to know if there's a fault because if the, fault, if the TPM fault light is on and you go around and check pressure and all the pressure is good, might be an indicator that there's a TPM fault and it might need to have the sensor either recalibrated or you might need to actually replace it because there might be a problem with it. Age of the tires, this was another one. So typically five years is too old for a tire. Also if there's any kind of weathering cracks or uh, feathering of the tire or cupping, these can all be indicators of either low tire pressure, too much tire pressure, bad shocks or struts. Um, they could be suspension components that are worn out that is causing it to jounce or jostle around too much. Check your suspension components. Some of them have grease fittings. These grease fittings are known as Zerk fittings and you can use a grease gun, whether you're doing it by hand or you have one that shoots grease through air. It has an air pneumatic grease, okay? They also have cordless grease guns those things can come in handy too. Um, but if they have Zerk fittings, usually you're gonna wanna shoot them back up full of grease, right? Lube, oil, filter. A lot of times I think a lot of the newer guys mistake the lube, oil, filter for just literally oil and filter because most modern cars don't have Zerk fittings on them anymore, but there are a lot of mid to late 90s and even early 2000s uh, pickup trucks that have them even I think maybe a couple of the newer ones too, if I'm not mistaken. I'd have to go back and through my memory and think about it, but I wanna say that Ford still has Zerk fittings for their heavier duty trucks. Now, how does it benefit you as a technician? Okay, so if you have stumbled across several things that all fit within the customer's needs as far as them being safety issues or uh, even potential reduced life of their vehicle issues that they can take care of, sooner than later depending on their budget but you let the service rider and you let the customer decide what their budget is and then they will go from there but you'll be surprised there's a lot of people that genuinely genuinely want to keep their car on the road and not go and trade vehicles in all the time and so a lot of the things that you point out to them you can actually take care of that day in most cases and that's going to improve your time as a mechanic, okay? It depends on what all work that is approved, but let's say you're kind of lacking in hours because maybe you had a rough week or something like that, this is a great way for you to improve your hours is through making annotations and letting the service rider and the customer decide if they want to take care of any of the faults that you found. 
I will also say do not be afraid to annotate certain things that you find. Doesn't, doesn't mean that you're specifically going to be the mechanic or the technician working on it. So if you have an Audi and you see the oil pan is leaking and you start freaking out because you don't have e torques or triple squares or anything like that, rather than do that, annotate it, okay? It's still important. It's important for the company, it's important to the customer, and it's important for you, okay? It's peace of mind. Like I said, you might not be the guy even working on it. It might go to someone completely else, but so what if you are the guy that ends up working on it? It's not as bad as it seems. There's going to be service information. There's going to be people around you to help you out with it, okay? It's still nuts and bolts at the end of the day. Yes, sometimes there's a longer path must be walked in order to finish said job. Um, but leave that up to the customer and the service rider. I don't feel like you should make the determination by saying, well, it's weeping, it's not really leaking, so we'll just wait and if it's still their next service or it gets worse next service, then we'll, we'll annotate it. No, 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 no. Annotate it. Is it weeping or is it leaking? Is there actually little drip droplets formulating and getting on the splash guard? If so, then you need to annotate that. You also should be checking the oil level before you drain the oil. So now we're in this um, before slash after repairs part of the discussion that I was wanting to talk to you guys about. So before you change the engine oil, if you have it in the air and you see that it's leaking oil, before you even touch that drain plug, I want you to lower the vehicle back down and pull and check the dipstick to see how much oil is left on the dipstick before draining it. All right, so if you go to pull the dipstick and there's nothing on it, what should you do then? I would say grab a catch funnel of some kind and instead of letting it drain into your regular oil catch that goes out for the recycle, catch it in some kind of receptacle that you can pour into some kind of measurement device to find out how much actually did come out. And if a couple of drops comes out, that's bad. And I've seen those cars come in for oil change. You're wondering how they even made it there. Two, so you've already dropped the oil filter, check for that double gasket, take your rag, give it a quick wipe where it would go first, right? When you put the oil filter on and you get it snugged down good, make sure to spray it down with something or take rags and wipe it as good as you can and then spray it with some brake cleaner or something like that. But get it nice and cleaned up. You don't want it to be all messy. If you had to do a bigger repair, say you had to change out a radiator or something like that and you got coolant on something, if you can, take the time out to go over to maybe like the wash area and either wash it off with the pressure washer from underneath or, or a garden hose and just let it kind of flood around the top of the bell housing so you rinse all the coolant off and then you can proceed about your business with going for your road test. If you did have to do anything coolant related, pressure test it when you're done. Pressure test the cooling system, make sure the hose isn't popping off. The Venturi airlift is only there to pull in a vacuum and it'll collapse the hose around the lower portion of the radiator, but it will not actually pressurize to the point where it'll pop off. So it might seem like it's holding a vacuum, but it might not hold pressure. So you're gonna to wanna to pressure test it. Anytime you interrupt the cooling system, really. Torque specs, okay, when should you use them? Look, I mean, they're gonna tell you to use them every time on everything. I'm gonna tell you that if it's made out of plastic, use the torque specs. When you close the hood, it doesn't hurt to do a quick little walk around the front and the sides on the quarter panels okay make sure you didn't get it all greased up on their brand new car or what have you make sure you have a microfiber rag and some way to be able to clean it off whether it's uh, some detail spray stuff from your detail area or you have your own like for instance I've got my little Meguiar's wash and wax that I bought from my toolbox I think I've probably used it more on cars than I have from my own toolbox I haven't used it on the toolbox yet in fact I let a, a friend of mine, a new friend of mine over at work borrow it for his toolbox. So he cleaned his toolbox up with it. I still haven't cleaned mine with it, but it's good stuff to have on hand for stuff like that. Also, same thing with the floor cover thing, right? Want to make sure that there's one in there. If there's not in there, make sure to put one in there. And if you get a little spot in the carpet, go to the detail area. Try to clean it up or see if they can clean it up if you don't know what you're doing. At least that way it doesn't go and then all of a sudden your greasy footprint, right? It's actually kind of nice having a detailed department, I'm not going to lie, because there were a couple of times over at the independent shop where I was like, ah, I don't know how to get that out. We don't have any detail equipment. Uh, but Shane actually had some stuff that was perfect for it, and he was able to handle it. Um, but lucky me, right? So 
Got a detail department now, so if anything happens like that, or it's like, oh, okay. I'm gonna bring it over to these guys. Maybe they can use their little steam cleaner vacuum deal to clean it up and make it look new again. That'd be great. Saves me a whole bunch of discussion and headache with the service writer or the service manager about that stuff, right? So it's definitely beneficial having a, 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 detailing, a detailing crew uh, working with you. There's one more thing that I really started to think about today that's been extremely beneficial with being back over the dealership, which has made life so much easier. And you can ask a lot of independent guys out there what I'm talking about, because if you're a dealer tech and you, you're not really quite sure because you never ran into it yet, or maybe you're a DIY and you only have a few projects under your belt so you haven't ran into it yet, but I will tell you, having OEM components has been a blessing in disguise. Oh my God, just the fit, fit right every time kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like when you ask for the part and it comes, it is of the right size because it was from factory and it fits. So I'm not having to modify it or send it back and wait a couple days for it to get resized. When the parts come in, I bring the car in, I go to work and the parts fit. So it has definitely made my life a lot, lot easier. I'll tell you that. So anyway, that's all I got for this video. Oh, oh, oh. I also became a Mopar expert. No joke, got my Mopar expert badge to go side by side with my Jeep badge. And I've just started the Uconnect course. So I'm very excited about that because once I get done completing the Uconnect course, that means I should know pretty much all the ins and outs of pairing, linking, uh, syncing, and everything else when it comes to phones, the home theater system that they have with inside the Pacifica, uh, the touchscreen display system for the Uconnect 5, the Uconnect 4. It's pretty cool stuff. I've just started one course already and I've learned like a lot. So I'm taking like a little break tonight, I think, and then I'll come back to it tomorrow. I woke up really, really early in the morning and I went at it for like four or five hours straight. And I took a little cat nap and then went to work. So I think I'm going to take a little break tonight uh, from the studying. But I am going to get back on it. Look, you if you want to get to the top, you have to do what it takes to get to the top. Lots and lots of studying, okay? This, there's training to be done, and some of it needs to be done within a timely time frame. I have some uh, these Chrysler specific technician courses that I have to take, and there's one that I have to take before mid month, otherwise, it goes bye bye, and I have to wait until next month, which means that I'll have to wait one year, one month before I can be considered certified again in one particular area. Forget how they judge that, but there is different areas to be certified in at Chrysler, multiple different areas. So like where I got the Jeep Expert badge and I've worked on the, got the Mopar one, I'm working on the Youth Connect and I'm going to work on the RAM and then that means I have the Expert series done. There's also a series for specialists, there's a series for masters, then you have your Chrysler specific training that you have to go to for your levels, and there's a Chrysler certified program that you have to go to. Lots and lots of information, but you can get and stack up all different types of certs, but you have to put in the work and I keep... Uh, I, I try to keep my younger guys motivated about this. It's very important to me because uh, I got a couple of these new Express Lube tests. I let them know, like, how much studying have you got done? Did you do any testing over the weekend, like on Saturday? Uh, I had to move or I had to do this. Try to stay on top of it. Try to stay focused, man, because, I mean, I can, I can tell that they want to do more, but you have to put in the time and you have to get all the training complete up to a certain point where they can let you do more. It's not that they don't want you to do more. You have to prove it on paper too. And Mopar has to see that because you have to be certified to do certain jobs. So if you want to do more, they want you to do more too. But you have to work to get there. That means, unfortunately, having some long nights like I've had to have. Like having a, uh, just a dedicated Saturday, you know. How much time are you willing to invest in your own career? I am super excited and I'm super jacked and super pumped. And hopefully a lot of my energy is getting transferred over to these young guys. I can see it. I can see it. Just the last couple of videos that I've done and the last couple of uh, conversations that I've had with my new guys, they're moving them legs. They're getting it done. I like what I see, okay? Yes, sometimes slow is smooth and smooth is fast. 
But if you can be smooth and fast and fast, that's even better, right? Let's see if you can wrap your head around that one. All right, that's all I got for this video. I know it was long, but we didn't talk yesterday. So I guess dual conversations on video for you guys. Cheers. See you next time. This is...